Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, we'll give people a couple of more minutes uh, to join us. We've got people from all over Australia joining us today. So while we're waiting, can I ask that people type in, in the chat um, which country you're calling from? So I'm from Larrakia country, and I will start the ball rolling with that. That's great. Lots of, oh, that's fantastic. Really good to see um, the variety. We've got people from everywhere. Hello, everyone. If you're just joining us, uh, we're just waiting for people uh, to come in. So please type in the country that you're calling in from in the chat. Thank you. Mm. All right. Um, I'd like to start today um, by acknowledging that I'm hosting this call from Larrakia country. I acknowledge Larrakia people as the traditional owners of the Darwin region. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many countries that people are calling from today and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. We are um, the NT branch of the Australian Evaluation Society. We've got Alison Reedy, my co-convener here as well. Um, and for those of you who haven't joined an Australian Evaluation Society webinar today, um, you know, run by volunteers, these seminars are free and we really welcome a diverse audience. So, so please do share um, the opportunity with your colleagues. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, if you're not presenting, could you please um, turn your video off for now uh, and make sure that you're on mute um, and pop any questions in the chat as they occur to you um, as our presenters are speaking and then we will um, come to them and have a discussion uh, at the end and I'll facilitate questions. All right, and today we are talking about what good looks like in the Barclay designing an evaluation framework for the Barclay Regional Deal and its collaborative approach. And we have two people joining us today from the Measuring Change Working Group. So Lucy McGarry has been the Monitoring Evaluation and Learning Coordinator in the Barclay Backbone team since 2021. She has a background in community development, research and evaluation, focused on Indigenous communities and programs across Australia. And Pat is a Warramungu woman and chair of the Native Title Group, uh, Pat of uh, the Pata Aboriginal Corporation in Tennant Creek. She has 35 years experience, goodness Pat, <laughs> working in the Commonwealth Government, uh, including on advisory groups to federal and NT ministers. She's been back home in Tennant Creek for the last 22 years and was CEO of Julakiri Aboriginal Corporation for 15 years. Pat's now retired and draws on her diverse life experiences and volunteers her time on a range of local groups and boards, including the Barclay Regional Deal Governance Table, to help support much needed systems change in the Barclay. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Lucy and Pat. Thank you both for joining us today. Okay. Yeah. Can we go first? Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Lucy. Thanks for the introduction, Christabel. Um, Pat and I are sitting here in our office in Tennant Creek on Wurrumungu country. So um, I'd first like to pay my respects and acknowledge uh, the Wurrumungu people of, of whom um, Pat is a member and um, to really acknowledge the work that has been done across the Barclay to support this, this evaluation framework we're going to talk you through today. A lot of people, local Wurrumungu and from other language groups across the Barclay have been involved and, um, yeah, really like to acknowledge those people. And did you want to say anything, Pat? Probably wait until further into the discussions around uh, that. But, yeah, but thank you, Christabel, for your acknowledgement and welcome. Mm. Yep. Mm. And thanks everybody for joining us uh, today. 
And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get started. Just the opening slide here is the title of this uh, talk, What Good Looks Like in the Barclay. And you can see the text down uh, to the right-hand side of the tree that is in local Wurrumungu language. And that's the vision of the Barclay Regional Deal being translated into Wurrumungu. So the vision for the Barclay Regional Deal is strong Barclay communities and families together determining their future and thriving in both worlds. And so that uh, translation down there is in uh, Wurrumungu. So uh, this slide is, well, just acknowledging he, we're here in Tennant Creek, um, again, oh, Wurrumungu country. Sorry, Lucy, I just, I just want to interrupt just for a second. We've got a, a message in the chat um, that someone can't see the presentation. Can I just make sure that everybody else can see the presentation? Please, can, yeah, Kat, you can see the presentation. Thank you. Yes. All right, Robert, I'm not quite sure why you can't. Everyone else seems to be able to see it. Maybe try coming out and then joining back in. But everyone else can see your presentation, so please carry on. Sorry, Lucy. Great. And if anyone has any advice on how I get rid of this tab across the top, that would be awesome. You know, see, see this tab here that shows all the new share. If um, I don't know if there's a way of getting rid of that so everybody doesn't have to look at it. Um, is it that one maybe? Disable annotation? Should I try it, that? It doesn't bother me. I, I actually can't see it. Okay. But I oh, think great. it depends all on right. way we'll different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Someone else said they can't see the tab, so maybe it just depends on um, on the setup screen people have got. But it's fine for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, go ahead. Um, yeah. And thanks. Just wanted to say too, Pat and I are excited about this opportunity to share the work that we've been doing here with others. Um, and this photo, actually, I just wanted to spend a, a minute on it. We were talking about it this morning. This is a tree that's out in um, the dam, which is about 5Ks north of Tennant Creek, and it's one of my favourite spots around here. And I realised, um, you know, we have we talk a lot here about working in the middle space between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal worlds, and I realised this tree is kind of this three-pronged, you know, there's that middle space, that, that middle trunk there, um, and it's this beautiful, strong tree, but in fact, this tree is sitting in a dam uh, which was created since colonisation. So the landscape's been changed and essentially, you know, damaged in some ways uh, to create this dam. Um, and it's a bit really a good metaphor for the, the kind of the context that we're working in here, that colonisation has changed uh, the Barclay region and this work that we're doing trying to find that middle space is it's imperfect and uh it's complex and you know sometimes the dam is full of water and sometimes it's empty and it's 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 muddy and cows go in there and die so um it's it's complex and yeah i don't know if you wanted to say anything about that pat and probably the other bit around it is the um uh, where the dam's been built is a sacred site and um you know when it was actually you know dug up and, and you know the wall built there wasn't any sort of discussions with the um Warrenga people about it and it just um happened and this was through the the period of where people were being moved off um stations to the outskirts of Tennant creek as well so um, you know, the council at the time decided to do it and um, not realising that the the damage to the site. So, and because land rights wasn't around at the time, um, and this is the type of things as part of a colonisation that Aboriginal people have actually had to clear, adapt, but, yeah, you know, just accept that, you know, this is something that happened and you can't change what's happened. So, you know, like the discussions now is about the name change of the dam, you know, to give it the significance that it should have. Mm -hmm. But what's important, what Lucy's saying is that middle space is um, how, how do we actually get there and how do we operate in that space to benefit the people that we serve? Mm, so that's a... You know, really under underlying theme in all the work that we're doing here, that trying to to find that middle space that where Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people move into, that we both move out of our comfort zones into this middle place to work out how to um, work better together 
uh, and create better outcomes. So, so yes, now I'm going to move along, um, except now that my presentation isn't moving along. So we seem to have just had a bit of a jam. There we go. We wanted to locate you to, well, let you know where we are. So the Barclay is in the Northern Territory. It's an it's a area about the size of the United Kingdom. Uh, it has a population of about six, 7,000. Mm, seven and a half thousand people. Seven and a half. Mm. And about across the Barclay, are we about 70% Indigenous? Yeah, 82%. 82%, there you go. Pat knows the stats. Um, and Tennant Creek is the largest town, which is about three, three and a half thousand. Three, yeah, three, three and, and a half, half thousand. thousand. So probably more, more than two and a half thousand Aboriginal people live in the in Tennant Creek um, itself. And we wanted to let you know where, whoops, where we are in terms of um, the language groups in this area. So uh, this map isn't perfect. I know it's a little bit uh, blurry, but I was just going to get Pat to talk to you about the range of different language groups across the Barclay. So we've got 11 language groups that um, probably are spread across the, the Barclay. And because of the way the history policies were, a lot of the people actually migrated into Tanner Creek after 1968, you know, people were pushed off for um, stations and community councils and those types of things. So as, as the Warramunga people, you, know, you actually had a whole lot of different language groups actually living in the same space. Um, you know, a lot of years would actually know that where you know, policies have pushed people into um, communities um, living on somebody else's country. And all you have to do is look across the Barclay is what air and all the things that are actually going on in what air at the moment and the different language groups that are there. Ali Karung is one of those ones where policy has pushed people from all the different language groups down in the southeast area and, um, and the Walpuri people that actually move because of the, um, we call it the, was it massacre? Connoisseur the Connoisseur massacre. massacre that moved into and living on Kadich and Warramunga country. So the conflict has gone on between Aboriginal people, let alone, um, you know, the non-Indigenous people in that space. So 11 language groups that are actually living um, in Tanner Creek proper. And um, so we've got to look at ways on how to be, you know, smooth smooth over that we're actually you know supporting people to become strong within their own families so it gives a bit of an insight to what we're actually dealing with here mm. so there's a lot of complexity cultural um complexity historical um, oh, yeah. and yeah. before you go on just mm. what lucy's saying is the complexity is the assumptions that aboriginal people are homogenous we're not homogenous and you know like everyone's got to be treated um as individuals you know, like it, it's accepted when people go overseas that they um, cater to the protocols or, you know, they go to Italy or go to Greece, they're not all the same. So um, European non-Indigenous people will actually accept that as the norm when they travel overseas. Yet the assumption is when they travel across Australia, we're all the same. So it's about shifting that talk as well. Thanks, Pat. We could talk for hours and hours, so we're going to um, try and keep it a little, you know, fit within the framework of the time we have. I always like to acknowledge the Blue Mountains and the Gundungurra and Darug people, which is um, the, the country where my husband and three lovely kids are. So um, the purpose of today's presentation. So we would really like to give you a summary of the work that we've done here so far, just briefly walk you through the steps. Um, we'd like to present key parts of our framework to you. So that includes our, our story of change tree, which is um, in the image there on the right. That's our theory of change, essentially. Um, we have a rubric for our principles, which are the other key part of um, our framework and uh, some outcome indicators. So um, these are a couple of the key elements we want to introduce you to. Uh, and we'd also like to share with you some of the learnings that we've um, we've gone through because there's been quite a few challenges and there still are quite a few challenges in this work. So um, really keen to share those with you. So 
I'm going to give you a very brief, and we won't spend much time on this, but um, the Barclay Regional Deal itself is why we're here uh, or why I'm here. And um, it's, I want to give you a very brief synopsis of, of the deal itself for those of you who may not know. So these regional deals are something that are quite new. Um, the Commonwealth Government has um, started in the last four or five years across a couple of different sites in Australia. And the idea is that three levels of government come together and invest money together to uh, develop a region as opposed to funding individual programs or projects. So it's kind of a new approach to regional development. And uh, we are, Tennant Creek and the Barclay is, is a site for one of these regional deals. And you can see there's a little bit of a timeline here. Um, and uh, this is a process which has been quite contentious in the community because what started off as quite a community-driven um, uh, initiative became a, a very sort of top-down government-led initiative and you can see even you know the the image on the on the right of your screen there is the list of 28 projects that got funded under the deal um, so that was a result of the three levels of government coming together they had a brief consultation with the community and came up with these priorities and these initiatives which uh, the community is quite frustrated about on many levels uh, and we also have Stronger Places, Stronger People, which is a Department of Social Services. Um, we have funding through them. So they fund my role. Um, I'm part of the Backbone Organisation, which is an independent organisation set up to help facilitate um, the implementation of these projects. Uh, but Stronger Places, Stronger People is all about systems change. So it's about the way of working and about um, not just delivering individual projects, but changing the whole system uh, to create better outcomes. And I'm going to briefly ask Pat to talk, because we could talk for hours again on this, about the issues with, with this process, because this is the government story of the deal, but the community has a story of the deal as well. And, and that's the part that's been missing in, um, in all of this. So 2018, we... Um, a lot of years would have seen the um, the media around the incident of the little girl. Um, the Aboriginal community rallied um, media ministers and everyone else about what needed to um, happen to deal with those types of issues. The outcome is, you know, the three government, three tiers of government came together. They identified what the um, projects were going to be, so more in the infrastructure development than people support and um, development. So, from a um, sitting in in the broad, in in the community and watching this um, develop, it really wasn't about meeting the needs of the what the original intent was for the Aboriginal people coming together, and um, you know, it took three years to um, shift the governance table to, um, to change their way of thinking around what needed to happen to one is about being inclusive for the Aboriginal community um, across the, the whole of the Barkley. So, you know, that looks good from a government perspective that they tick the boxes, but that doesn't necessarily meet our needs and any of those sorts of things. So when, um, the change of the backbone team, Lee, Lucy and, and Ben and a few others came in, um, worked with them around changing what it, what it looks like. So it's having the Aboriginal input. So the different language groups, if you can see on, on the screen is, um, they're the language groups across the Barclay, but how do they actually fit into the um, governance table? So from us as the native title group, we had to fight for representation um, because, you know, there was another group that um, the Minister Scallion actually created that um, became the voice, but they weren't necessarily the right group of people to speak on behalf of um, Tanner Creek proper and be representative of all the people. So we had to shift the way that it was actually, um, how it actually evolved. And, um, and that took, you know, over, over three years to actually... Um, one is to win the minds and hearts of the people that sit at the governance table. 
and then get the right people that actually worked in the backbone team to actually see um, that there was a different way of doing business. Mm. So the the painting there is um, the the big the red circles um, are they're the governance table members. So this is the governance of the Barclay Regional Deal, and this is where the the collective impact uh, collaborative. Uh, work is is meant to take place amongst all these different stakeholder groups. So there's the three levels of government, um, PADA, the native title group, the two land councils, CLC, NLC, heads of the Aboriginal corporations, that's youth, NGOs, business sector, and now for representatives coming from the, um, the broader region and the language groups. We will move along just because we, we want to get to the framework, but we just wanted to give you a bit of a um, context of what we're, what we're measuring essentially and why we're here. Um, so moving on to the process we went through. So when um, I arrived early last year in the monitoring and evaluation role at the Backbone and was tasked with co-designing an evaluation framework with the community. So I first set about uh, setting up a group in the community. So we called it the Measuring Change Working Group. Um, it took about six months for that group to come together because I was new in the community, you know, new white lady in the community um, talking about evaluation. I didn't make, you know, heaps of friends on the first day. So not everyone wants to talk about evaluation, surprise, surprise. But um, after six months, and Pat was really key in that process, connecting, you know, with the right people in the community. Um, so Pat was initially said to me, this group has to be majority Aboriginal. We need to make sure that if we're measuring something, it's all about values. They've got to be local community values. So um, we, after six months, we had, had a group with um, nine members. We also have some resources in that group who, uh, one of them, John Gunther actually, who does a lot of work in the Northern Territory in evaluation. Uh, we also have a couple of government partners who sit there, um, less as, as sort of voting members or contributing members, but more, you know, if there's something in particular we need, um, they can help us out. So we had 10 meetings from July until um, early this year. Uh, and the work that we're going to show you has been created across those meetings. And just wanted to show you that, yeah, that photo there is of um, uh, our meeting in just a couple of weeks ago. And that's a little Rue who um, I've been fostering who comes along to meetings as well. So we followed these four steps of developing a place-based evaluation framework. This comes from Jess Dart's um, uh, framework uh, guidelines, which I found really useful because they're so flexible. They, they really are place-based. So um, yeah, th th it was really easy to adopt them as a outline of how we should go through this process. So that's what we did. So I'm just going to walk you through a little bit um, those four steps. Um, so step one is around scoping out, you know, what you're evaluating. So we and the measure and change group met and said, right, what are we evaluating? This, this collaborative way of working, um, the context, do we actually understand and is the Barclay Regional Deal responding to it? Um, the governance table that's been set up, the Aboriginal Alliance, the working groups, the backbone, how effective are they? Uh, the 28 initiatives themselves, are they creating outcomes? Are they the right initiatives? Uh, and progress towards our vision and changes that are important to the community. Now we, we hit a bit of a bit of a bit of a wall here because unfortunately the Barclay Regional Deal didn't have a vision at that point and didn't have principles outlined and didn't have clear community priorities outlined. So it was it was kind of a challenge for our group because we were set up to evaluate something that hadn't yet defined those things. So we turned from evaluators essentially into kind of program designers because we had to go back to the governance table and say, hey, look, you know, before we start measuring what you're doing, we need to know what it is that, why, why you're doing it and what are your principles. So we took a few months to do that work with the governance table and with the community. But coming back to scoping out the evaluation, so what was the purpose of it? Now, my first conversation about evaluation work in the Barclay, Pat said to me, it's about truth-telling. It's got to be about truth-telling. And that is 
a constant um, constantly comes up in conversations um, everywhere across the Barclay, the importance of truth telling. So that really underpins our framework. Um, supporting learning and um, development of the deal. So essentially this work has a developmental purpose. Um, so um, developmental evaluation is, is kind of, um, you know, underpinning what we're doing. We also want to provide evidence of what's working and not working and build some community ownership because as Pat has explained, you know, it's, it's been a rocky road so far. We need to build the community engagement with the, the deal. Uh, we also want to help build the knowledge around how to do this kind of work in other locations. Um, so our audience is obviously for the evaluation, we want to report back to the communities themselves. Um, we have several funding bodies and partners that we need to report to through the evaluation and also those of you out there who might be doing similar work where we, we see you as our audience as well. Um, who do we need to include and engage with? So yes, there's about 60 communities and homelands across the Barclay, as you saw on that map, 11 language groups. We have government partners and their expectations, and we really wanted to align our work with existing frameworks. We, Although we want to do something unique and place-based and community-led, we also want our work here to be able to talk to other frameworks, like closing the gap, and frameworks which have relevance across the whole country because we want them to be able to learn from our work and um, yeah, for them to, to be able to speak to each other. So there's also Northern Territory Government Social Outcomes Framework that we've aligned our work with, the Erasing Nest Framework, some of you might be familiar with. Um, so yeah, we had quite a lot of requirements in a way on, on our work um, and we have selected indicators that align or are actually, you know, come directly from closing the gap, for example, or um, others. Did you want to say something, yeah. Pat? So just probably, you know, if you look at the frameworks that are around, then if you put yourself into the shoes of, um, you know, the Aboriginal corporations and Aboriginal people, they're actually responding to each one of those frameworks or whoever's actually judging based on who's paying who, when. And um, so you're forever um, dealing with not only the NT government, but you're dealing with the federal government, you know, for the same group of people. And, um, and never the twain should meet in, in that space. So, um, you know, like the discussion early on was around, you know, this collaborative impact stuff is about how does everyone, you know, talk the talk and walk the walk to actually make a difference on, on the ground. And if you, um, if you move in, into looking at all these frameworks, yeah, it hasn't worked, but no one actually wants to do it differently to ensure that the people on the ground are actually benefiting out of what's being put in place by, you know, the government. Mm. So a lot of work to do. Um, now, our context, and we might not go into this so much now, yeah. Pat, just because we're already um, mm -hmm. 30 minutes in, but... As, as Pat talked at the beginning of our introduction about the complexity of um, the colonial history here, which, you know, more recently includes the Northern Territory intervention, um, communities went from having local Aboriginal corporations running them to having shires, um, you know, super shires, so local government running them. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot in our context that we need to consider. So that's a big part of our framework um, and what, um, yeah. So this is our theory of change, which is uh, we've used a tree painting, which was done by uh, a local artist. And we have a massive canvas of this painting, a sort of like seven foot, eight foot tall canvas that we take out to communities for our conversations with them and what we I'm just thinking I might go to another slide no I won't I'll stay on this slide I think um sorry so we've got our foundations and principles and apologies if it's not quite big enough for you to read but our principles are our foundations so if if we work in alignment with these principles and we have those resources 
shared vision, well-resourced backbone, flexible funding. We should be able to deliver those actions and outputs, the working groups, um, the governance table, community planning. We should be able to deliver the Barclay Regional Deal Initiatives. In the mid-level of the tree, we have the systems changes that we're looking for. So they're essentially um, Umbrani people uh, setting the agenda telling the story and there's data sovereignty. So that's about changing power dynamics in the system. Who's telling the story? Sorry, go on. Someone talking? Oops, sorry, I'll bring you back up. Are you talking, Christabel? No? Should I keep going? Yeah, keep going. Sorry, I think someone must have accidentally been off mute, but I think oh. I've muted everyone now. No worries. I'm just putting you guys down here so that we can see the, the whole tree. Yeah, so we have systems level changes, which are changing power dynamics. Um, we want policies and procedures and practices and resourcing to change so that they are trauma informed and actually respond to local needs and values. Um, we want relationships and connections to change so that we're actually trusting, sharing data, reflecting and um, improving the work that we do regularly. Uh, and we're also looking at um, changing assumptions and beliefs. So those really deep system level changes. So questioning whose lens are we looking at this from and are we actually working as equals in this middle space? So the top level is our, are our five, whoops, apologies. Um, up in the tree there, so the, the high level outcomes, so the five key change areas that we heard from the community that they want to see. Um, so we're going to keep moving so we can cover some of this. So these are our five principles, which we worked um, a lot. We had quite a lot of workshops. We've been doing community planning across the Barclay and different communities, so hearing what, what's really important in this work. So the community-led aspect is, uh, you know, really the, the driver here, I think, and we're not community-led. You know, this is we're not saying we're doing this yet. This is, this is what we want to be doing. Um, so working together from the middle space is the second one, growing strengths and capability. That's actually two-way. It's about growing the capability in the, in the local Aboriginal community, but also growing the capability in government partners and funders who come in to learn more about this context and how to work in this context. So we, we need to improve their capability um, to work here. Uh, accountability to the community is key and this building trust to, to reflect and learn is, um, yeah, really, really key. So that involves using data, obviously. So that's um, the evaluation comes in there. Did you want to say something, Pat? No, I'm wait. You're wait. Mm -hmm. This is our rubric. So to measure how well we are going, um, how well we are working in alignment with our principles, this is still in development, this rubric, but essentially keeping with that tree metaphor, you know, looking at what does community leg look like when it's just at the sowing the soil, you know, fertilizing the soil stage up into when it's a fully fledged tree. So we intend to use this rubric as a, a tool, um, both a tool itself in that we use that annually to reflect uh, the governance table members as well as working group members, asking community members, how well are we going against this? As well as collecting other data that we can bring um, to this framework. So this is really key for me, actually, if we were only doing one part of this evaluation, this rubric is the most important. You know, this really is a, quite a principles focused um, evaluation and um, this rubric is really important, still in development. We haven't finalised it yet, but wanted to give you a sense of it. Uh, the five outcome areas that we've identified in the story of change, just wanted to show you the, where they came from. Uh, we used a range of different data sources to, to, to identify those five outcome areas and they came from community plans, from workshops. Um, a Thousand Voices report was done here in 2018 uh, that interviewed children and young people about what's important to them and what changes they want to see. Obviously, in our measuring change working groups, we talked a lot about these issues. 
Um, we've done a lot, range of interviews with governance table members using that most significant change and most significant learning uh, format to um, also understand what's, what's most important. Uh, and from the Tenant Creek Youth Forum, we, we spoke to 40 students there. So out of those different data sources, we came up with five um, outcome areas. And you might notice that these are quite aligned with other frameworks. So the Erasy Nest framework, for example. But there are a couple of key areas where our framework differs, um, which we're going to come to. But there are evaluation questions, which I think are probably not something we need to spend too much time on right now. But I am just going to go back um, to this slide. And I want to give you a little bit of a snapshot and I'm going to take you to another uh, screen now, which hopefully is not too hard for me to find. Um, my apologies, everybody. I need to find something and it's behind there. Where is it? Oh, no. Just talk amongst yourselves while I... Um, scramble to find. I want to give you a little bit of detail around um, some of our, how we're going to measure these uh, high level change areas. So just need to move this again and put that on play and yep, move that back up. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so hopefully people can see. So those five high level outcome areas uh, the, the darker green circles are the, out, uh, the domains. I guess a lot of people would call them domains or we're calling them change areas. And the lighter green circles are, are kind of, you know, what do these look like? What, what are the actual outcomes we're looking for within those? And just wanted to point to a couple of key changes, a couple of differences in our framework here in the Barclay is that um, with kids and youth are safe and supported, uh, housing is a really key component of that here in the Barclay. So housing is a really big issue here and everybody said you can't measure safety of children without looking at housing. And in other frameworks, housing sits separately under material basics and that was, everybody said, no, it's, we've got to keep that in the picture. It's got to be visible um, around um, safety of youth. Uh, we also, another key difference is that um, Rather than just measuring health as a domain on its own, our framework brings health and culture and cultural identity and strength together as one. Uh, everybody said, you know, culture is a key part to physical health, so we can't separate those. Um, so the sorts of things that we're talking about here are having strong connection to country, culture, family and community, good social and emotional well-being, decreased racism, and I'm going to very quickly take you to, um, to give you a little bit of a sense of, because part of our framework that we're really proud of is we've developed some really strong qualitative um, indicators for measuring strength of culture, which is something that other frameworks uh, lack. Uh, I know in Closing the Gap, um, there's a measurement around um, language spoken, for example, an Indigenous language spoken as a measure of strength of, uh, of culture. And we do include that indicator, but we've also included a range of other locally designed indicators. So I'll just explain this diagram quickly. So the big circle there is the, the high level outcome. Um, we're saying that these three smaller circles are sort of preconditions essentially for families to be strong culturally, emotionally and physically. Families have to have strong connections to country, culture, family and community. They have to have good social and emotional well-being, and we need to see decreased experiences of racism for families to be strong. And I'm just going to give you a little snapshot. So language is obviously a precondition to families having those connections. Families connecting to country and culture is a precondition, and families and communities supporting each other is also a key uh, precondition. And that's this is one of the areas where we've develop some indicators. For example, here you can see um, we're looking for an increased percentage of people who provided support to their family and community. So that might be financial support, emotional, cultural, social, physical, 
And this is something that's not counted unless you are receiving some sort of carer's payment. Uh, it, it's not counted anywhere. And there are thousands of people working to support their families who give up job opportunities, give up all sorts of other opportunities because they're supporting family members. And, and that, that's a real strength in communities here and it's not measured anywhere. So we really wanted to, to bring out um, those, those elements. And we found that other frameworks are often quite deficit focused and really looking at um, problems in communities. Uh, so we really wanted to draw on some strengths. Yeah, okay. yep, good, keep going. And um, I know we're running out of time. So what I'm going to do is navigate back to um, the PowerPoint and just briefly would love to reflect um, our successes and challenges. So I'm going to put the slideshow back on. And I'm really interested to hear from Pat, actually, what she thinks the successes of this work have been. Probably the, um, the first one is the reshaping re, um, structure of the governance table. Um, at the beginning, it was you know, the government and the business people sitting at the table making decisions on how um, the funds were actually going to be distributed re um, in relation to the, um, what do you call it, the 28 um, strat initiatives. And then the other, other part of it is the bringing in, so now we've probably got about 70% Aboriginal people sit at the governance table. So shifting from just having two to, um, you know, it's about 14 of us now, I think, and that's without including the Alliance, the Aboriginal Alliance group. Um, so that, you know, you're having a, a bit more of a, um, you know, the value, I suppose, of Aboriginal voices um, making decisions that impact on Aboriginal people. The other part is um, having the ability to work with um, is it the agencies, um, to shift the way that they um, perceive what's, what's norm and, and do you want me to give the example about the use justice? I reckon we should keep moving just yeah. because, but Pat's got some great examples of yeah. some positive so, changes. Yeah, so it's about maintaining and, and shifting um, how people actually operate. And so when you um, work in the middle space, then it's about... Um, Every, everyone is is equal and then you know, we all shift the way that we interact with different people if you want to build relationships but you know for a long time the assumptions were that um, information is power therefore we've got to shift to actually move in line to uh, the way you know government you talked earlier around you know the policies and everything else the government policies are what drives a lot of the um, people that are employed and that are, those policies don't necessarily meet the needs of the people but um, and those policies belong to the agencies not necessarily the people they serve so it's about shifting that and what I see as part of all the work that Lucy and the, and the team have done is actually helping to shift and it's actually the, the ability to measure that shift for the people that are actually employed across the Barclay to, to work in our space. Um, and it's not about us fitting into um, the way, you know, the bureaucrats and mainstream operate in that space. Thanks, Pat. And I just want to reflect with you quickly um, in terms of the successes of this evaluation work so far. Um, we have helped establish a, sh a shared vision and agreed principles for the work, which wasn't there before. Um, the work has been led um, by an Aboriginal working group and had really strong Aboriginal voices. And I've said before that I think the term co-design is used to describe all manner of um, sins and uh, really loath to use it. And um, I think we've... Pat, 
said last week this is co-design. So um, if Pat's calling it co-design, I'll call it co-design. Um, and my screen seems to have frozen a little bit. So we've included voices from all across the Barclay in different age groups. We've described what positive change looks like according to these voices. We have created meaningful indicators of change that are unique to, to the, the Barclay, while at the same time, we have linked these to existing frameworks. So I see that as um, really key achievement. Obviously, lots of challenges too. One of those being, you know, it really takes time to do this work, trust, you know, just the fact that, um, you know, the time it's taken Pat and I to get to know each other. There's a lot of people coming in and out of communities like Tennant Creek uh, and relationships take time. So um, we have a lot of stakeholders with different expectations too in our work. So community, you imagine, you know, small homelands with three houses and no Wi-Fi and people speak English as a fifth language. And then we have Commonwealth um, government representatives as well. So we, we have a lot of different stakeholders. Um, there's been a push to get this done quite quickly. And obviously there's that, that tension between getting it done and, and getting it right. And that certainly, you know, people wanted this framework in three months and, um, you know, a year and a half later, we're just, we're just getting there. Um, the evaluation group also had to do some design work. As I mentioned earlier, we kind of were, and that, that, that's an uncomfortable space to be in. It's, uh, we're not quite authorised to be designers. So uh, we had to navigate that, that, those power dynamics essentially that, um, to do that work. And uh, yeah, should we be measuring outcomes and should we be focusing on our foundations? And this was something we've talked about a lot in the measuring change group. People said, no, we just need to get the foundations right. Let's, let's, it's not about setting distant outcomes because they're too far away. We need to focus on the foundations. So we're, we're really confident we can actually do both in our framework. So many indicators, we've got to narrow them down. We've got way too many. So we've got to somehow simplify them and take out the most, just to, you know, focus on the most important ones because you know you can have 50 million indicators, but we've actually got to use them. And the complexity of the early stages of the deal still really impacts on us. The community doesn't necessarily believe in uh, the potential it has. So uh, that's hindered our work. And of course, resourcing, we're all we're all stretched. Um, yeah. So our next steps, you can see there, one of them is about developing a team of community researchers here so this work can be ongoing and sustainable. So really keen to hear from anybody who's doing that work in communities. Um, I'd really like to learn from what that looks like in other places and how we can support something like that in the Barclay. And there's my contacts. And Christabel, I know we've gone over our time probably, but thanks everybody. And yeah. sorry, did you want to? No, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. You have done well. And you know, I was going to give you until 10 too. So you're actually a few seconds ahead by my clock. <laughs> so well done. Um, there's been some very nice comments in the, the chat around the theory of change, uh, change um, and the indicators. And I did see someone applaud when your rubric was up. Um, so um, I, I think there's a lot of interest. We have um, had a, quite a few people asking if you could go back to that slide with the key evaluation questions, just to give a little bit of extra yep. context. Um, and we also had a question about whether there is a report or anything that people can go to to find out more about this. But my understanding is it's still pretty new. So I'm thinking you probably don't have anything yet. Um, yeah, we don't have a report yet. Um, these, sorry, I'm just trying to find the evaluation questions. Um, no, no report. Uh, these slides are probably uh, the place where, you know, things are most, um, you know, culminated, where we're pulling things together. So I'm happy to share the, the slides and include um, a couple of the snapshots of our, of our indicators. But people are welcome to get in touch with me um, if they want further information. But uh, sorry, I'll just put this slide back up so you can see these key evaluation questions are actually largely informed by the Stronger Places, Stronger, Pe Stronger People UML framework, which is something we need to report into as they're one of our funders. 
Did you want to just talk us through a little bit what the key value ah, questions yeah. are? Maybe just just read them read them out. Yeah, sure. So I mean, obviously, the foundations and resources. Um, you know, it, that's a big assumption to make that we actually have the resources to do this work, uh, mm -hmm. and that we are following our principles. Um, so those first two questions are, are really important to me, probably the most important. Um, the quality and reach of our engagement and activities, so that's around uh, the governance table, the working groups, the backbones work, our ability to engage the community and communicate effectively. Um, those system changes, yes, what, what system changes are we seeing? Are we seeing any changes in power dynamics? Are we seeing that Umbrani people are telling the story here? Um, or is it the same old with just a new language? Um, instances of change. So I like this about the UML um, framework, which talks about because, you know, obviously those long term changes, those high level population outcomes are going to take a very, very long time. And we need to look at instances of change in the shorter term to help, um, well, help keep us all um, optimistic and positive and doing this work. Um, yeah, and that last one being around, yes, you know, to, to what extent are we achieving those, those intended outcomes? Um, lots of lovely comments in the chat. I think people are just really grateful um, to you for, for sharing your story uh, and for sharing the lessons learned um, along the way. Um, Pat, you mentioned before an example about positive change, and, and I think it'd be really good to talk about that. Okay, so um, part of the Bucky Regional deal was, you know, it was just after the um, Domdale um, report, and they were looking at the youth justice um, facilities you know, to be built across the, the Northern Territory. And the NT government actually came and um, was sitting at the governor's table and was saying this is the, the not only the principles but um, the facilities and what it's going to be, to, you know, the design of the facility and then this is how the program's going to be delivered. And what we did, you know, from the Aboriginal leadership group was actually pull that back and work with the Territory government and the NT families um, to shift not only the design of the facility, but the program itself and how it actually um, to be monitored and who, who is actually going to oversee that, even though the provider will actually report back to the, um, to the funding body. It, it is actually um, aligning to um, the Aboriginal um, leadership group in how um, the, the reports are actually going. So what's inside is actually going to be driven by the leadership group um, and not, not the Northern Territory government. So they've shifted and agreed to having kind of like a hands-off approach to how, how it will be done. So it becomes community-driven, community-owned. And, and, and you know, so that was a real shift. It took, took a while to um, get the senior bureaucrats to to let go, you know, because it was their program, it was their money, this is, this is the talk. And um, so we had to shift it to say, well, these are our kids and it's about how do we actually influence the change of behaviour, what do we need to build and how do we build capacity and support for the young people for the future. So it wasn't about a government program, it was about how do we um, shift it to the needs and, and wants of, of the young people that are going off the rails type thing. So um, from the Native Title Group, we just agreed to um, sign off on the Indigenous Land Use Agreement with the um, Territory Families, and that's been done today, should be there. And um, so, um, so I just been talking to Lucy earlier that to um, talk to some of the, the team from um, Territory Families and get feedback from them about what the process so whilst they were in the room with the, the native title group yesterday it was really positive in how they had to um, change but whereas sitting in the room you could feel that there was a lot of resistance because they're so used to being in control of that type of information 
and you know talked about the you know my experiences working in in the bureaucracy so you know if you've got somebody that understands that then it's easier to um, challenge you know the system as it is and we don't get very many Aboriginal people that have got that that type of knowledge on how um, governments work so you know so it's about how do they shift the way they they're going to um, do business, along with you know like how they're measuring that the changes actually make a difference on the ground. So it it is probably one of the you know it's the first project that'll be up and running. You know, so they'll start the works and those types of things as part of the deal, and it'll be a, probably a showcase. You know, like over the next you know six months or so, and probably the other one is. Um, we call it the the radar. Um, mm -hmm. um, the as part of the deal, there was you know like the funding that came in as part of the um, Bureau of Meteorology of actually building a radar um, thing in in Tennant. So they had to negotiate with the the Native Title Group around a lot of land, and in talking to them that you know that that wasn't an identified need by the Aboriginal community and um, so your pastoralists and everyone else has actually had a say that this is you know going to be built but it was the cost of that building which is where you know we as Aboriginal people are actually you know sucking it up because it's a lot of money being invested for an infrastructure and that's going to you know, be put up on a hill that's going to be in the horizon for ever and a day type thing. So is it something that we need or is it something that somebody else needs? So there's still some conversations that need to go on in that space. But the great thing is, for example, we met with the Bureau of Meteorology yesterday and they're really, because we have these principles lined out for this work, for the Blackley Regional Deal, they came to us and said, okay, so we know you have some principles. What's but can, can you tell, show us the framework that we need to work within? What are the indicators we need to be reporting against? And, um, you know, for example, they want to put up some boards that tell the story of the, the place, the site where they're building the, the weather station. And that's, that's one of our indicators is, um, you know, instances where truth telling is taking place. So mm -hmm. it's that even though it's something that we can't change the fact that the, the money has been allocated to something like a weather radar, we can include them in the, the framework of how we need to work together. And I was just going to quickly say that the most significant change and most significant learning interviews have been um, a great way of capturing these types of stories. And so although we might not see the overall system changing, there's examples of the system changing as we go. Thank you both. And I am conscious of time. There's lots of lovely comments in the chat. Um, and I'm conscious there are a few questions that we haven't got to. Lucy, thanks so much for sharing your contact details. Um, uh, on the end slide. Um, I think there probably will be a couple of people um, in, in the chat who take that opportunity um, to follow up with you. Um, and we'll see if we can get a couple of snapshots of some of the parts of the slides as you talked about to share with people because there has been um, a lot of interest um, and hopefully we can put the recording up to, um, to help share this really important work. And I would just like to wrap up by thanking you both so much. Um, for taking the time today. Um, I've really appreciated it and I can see that lots of people in the chat have really appreciated it as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you both so much. Yeah, and we've got someone in the chat asking if you can come back and give an update in a few months because I, I think um, it'd be really good to, to keep telling this story. Thank you both so much. Thank you everyone for joining us and we will follow thank up. Thank you.